issues like Ferguson and Charlton and all those kind of things keep coming back over and over and over again. And I have to admit it, but there is moments that I will say, can we just not get over this? When is racism going to stop and just we're going to get along and let it be? Or does it have to be constantly brought back up together? But is that the right attitude? Is that the way we should think? Is that a majority thought or is that a minority thought? Where is that coming from? And um, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. So what is the answer? to the differences in the world here, in the ethnicity issues that we're working with, to change that in a way that it's going to make an impact and effective. And what is it that Jesus would do? With me today is Reverend Ephraim Smith. He's the president of World Impact. He is also a speaker with Forge Kingdom Building Ministries. His latest book, The Post-Black and Post-White Church, addresses the issue of ethnic differences. And I have to be honest with you folks, when I started to work on this show today, my opinion changed when I started understanding the depth and the root of the real problem. And I know when you watch this show, it's not just about the differences in ethnicities, but it could be the differences in our own marriages, in our own problems, in our own struggles, because it doesn't just address one topic, it addresses them all. Ephraim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to just start off and just throw you right into it. You know, you say there are big differences in the ethnicities and they make an impact in the world today. And what is it that you're talking about? You're talking about like a minority and a majority group? What is it that you mean by that? Yeah, well, I'm really talking about the structure of race, that uh, there is a unbiblical, ungodly, but very real structure known as race that categorizes people based on the color of their skin, uh, their physical features. And so based on your skin color and your physical features, uh, we have created categories to decide who's smart, who's fast, who's good at science, who can dance well, who can clap on beat. And we live under under this matrix of these false labels. And it's far away from how God created us, not only to be individually, but to live in community together. You know, I have a hard time believing that in the beginning, but I have to add a but there. Um, Campus Crusade for Christ did actually a check on that. And they actually sent out interviews. Uh, a couple of people did that. I'm not sure, I believe it was Campus Crusade for Christ. They sent out like a hundred interviews that they would respond to work assignments. And what you just said, it was a certain type of group that would be picked, even if they had the same qualifications. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, so it, even when people see names on a resume, and if that name sounds like a quote unquote black name mm -hmm. or Hispanic name versus what they would think as a, a white name, uh, they begin regardless of where the person went to college, what their work experience. The matrix of race is, is so sinful, it's so broken that we live in this fallen world where, again, it could be based on skin color or, or physical features, or it could be based on a name that we attribute to a certain ethnic group or race then begins to make us think of characteristics and traits, stereotypes that, that could be very untrue about that person, but it's the fallen world in which we live. Right. So we're here today to say, what is the solution? And, and how do we work through that? And what I have learned from you and about three others, even if I never looked at that before because I was that part of the majority group, maybe being colorblind to it? Is that a word that you use in those kind of things? Yeah, well, I think that the majority of, of Christians that, that I interact with and people that wouldn't even say they're a part of the Christian faith, but they're just working to be good Americans or good people wherever they live, for the most part, uh, they don't want to be racist. They don't want to be uh, perceived as a person that would discriminate or mistreat someone because of their ethnicity or race. And so the, the initial thought is the way that you uh, become a good person in this context is to say, I don't see race. But that's not the solution. I, I think that reconciliation 
and relationship building is really the solution because if I were to put that same thought around gender and if I said, uh, well, you know, when I see you, I don't see a woman, I just see God. You'd say, that's what? not true. You, yeah. you yeah. have to see me as a woman. Or if, if I told you, I don't see my wife as a woman, then how did I know I was marrying a woman in the first place <laughs> if I never saw her as a woman? So okay. yeah. we, we have to say, God created you uh, a, as female. God created me as male. God created us specifically in, in a, ethnically, culturally in a way. And mm -hmm. why can't we see a blessing in that? and honor God and glorify God in that versus saying, I don't see it. I, I want you to but see it. But do you it. think that people are actually ignorant about it, that they don't realize it? Yeah. I, I don't I, think it's, in, some it's intentional, there's no doubt. There's just no doubt. I had a kid in my daycare and the parents said, don't come to that childcare anymore because he's black. I don't want you nothing to do with that daycare. So I, I know some are like flat out ugly, just ugly. Sure. But the majority of us, I think is, Flat out ignorance? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, I don't know what the percentages are specifically, but right. I would say this. Here's the common denominator. We all live in a sinful, fallen world. Right. And the issue of racial division or ethnic division is, is one component of the effects, the impact of living in an upside down, fallen, broken, sinful world. And so I would rather say whether it's ignorance, whether it's hatred or bigotry or prejudice or, you know, whatever it is, can we seek the solution found in Christ Jesus? Right. And, that, and I think that is where the core is in how to handle that. And my, my curiosity is, where did your passion come from? You know, where did this start for you that you are so passionate about this with World Impact? starting to address these issues instead of having all these little groups staying in their little groups. How do you bring them together? And uh, that's something you might have wondered too about is how do you bring everybody together instead of splitting everybody up in their own little world, in their own little group? Stay tuned. We will be right back. <music> Hope you join us on Barb TV today. Go to barbtv.org for the best ministry time you can ever have. Make sure you bring a pen and a paper and take lots and lots of notes. It's a great time to be able to sit and absorb and do the things that God has called you to do. And I'm just praying for that right now in the name of Jesus. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hi, I'm Gary Bell. Uh, associate pastor at Bayside Church of Citrus Heights, as well as co-founder of the Northern California Filmmakers Coalition and executive producer of Sacramento Filmworks, where we show you how film works. And I just want to tell you about an extraordinary show where it deals with the issues and challenges facing our world. It also provides hope for the hopeless. It also helps people come in contact with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's called The Barbara Marshall Show. You don't want to miss it. It's on barbtv.org. Check it out. You'll love it. of 19 I was a nanny and came to the United States of America and it was different it was like coming to the movies the cars were big you had Donald Duck pancakes as I call them which I'd never seen in my life before and donuts with holes in them and you guys were weird you know that you were just different but it was a cool weird but then when my husband and I I, I married somebody an American and an awesome guy his name is Ken Marshall. When we married and moved back to the United States and had children, the differences of the culture started to set in and there were huge differences between the two of us. And this is just a Western country and a Western country together. And it, we, end, we actually ended up in a divorce. So, and we married later, but the differences were so big and there was huge pain inside of that. It became quite some time to receive healing from that and to overcome that. And when you look 
at racism today from a different perspective is in the way that you have gotten hurt and I have gotten hurt and the healing that it takes place to overcome that. I have to admit to you, I no longer can say, just get over it. And um, that's why we're here today. How do you get over it? Ephraim, you are passionate about helping people get over it. But there is a way about that. But where did that passion for you start? Well, it really started in my own upbringing. I mean, I grew up in a, a city, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in, an, in the inner city part of that city. And some of the things that I experienced in, in my own life, I mean, my parents are from the deep south, my mom from Alabama, mm -hmm. my dad from Louisiana. And there were summers when I would go uh, to the places where they grew up. And I was just amazed how different it was that when I would go to Louisiana as a kid during the summer, it was still very racially divided. Uh, and so uh, blacks and whites, you know, they, wow. they didn't live in the same areas. Uh, I, I could see the difference in how uh, whites treated blacks uh, in terms of black people had to call white people by their last names, no matter how old. So I remember my grandmother calling a young white man who looked like he was barely in his 20s. She called him by his last name. Uh, she called him Sir, and he called her Mary. Uh, and never called her by her last name. The, it, as, and I watched this as a, as a little kid, and so I knew there was something not right. And then the neighborhood that I grew up in began to change. The more families that looked like my family moved in to the community, the more white families left the community. Is and, that what white flight is all about? Yes. You know, in, in the 1950s and 60s, and especially in the 70s, as uh, large cities, uh, whether it was Los Angeles or Chicago or New York or even uh, Sacramento, or well, became more and more uh, integrated, more multi ethnic and more multiracial, uh, a lot of white families moved. And it wasn't because, well, all these white families were racist. I mean, race could have been an issue, but it really it was a system that was racist and broken. It's almost like I'm hearing in it that, like, th those that move ahead in life and get richer and are chosen to get the better jobs move out to the nicer neighborhoods. Yes. Is that what I'm hearing? So, and yeah. then the rest kind of stays behind and you get a different kind of culture shaping. And it was really a, a, a systematic uh, initiative and program. There, there were banks and realty companies that worked oh, wow. together to create what we now know as suburbs. I mean, the suburbs is really a creation on the other side of integration, that uh, there really were uh, companies, banks, uh, uh, realty companies that would go into a neighborhood and they would scare white families. I mean, there are even stories in Chicago of how companies would pay uh, people that look like me to come into a community and, and be loud and violent and rambunctious. And then uh, a, a realtor would come by and knock on the door and say, I hear that there are some, some negative things going on in this community. Wow. I can help you buy a house in a nicer neighborhood and you should get out now before the house housing prices really go down. They created it. And so, uh, you know, so in, in some ways, and, and again, I don't mm -hmm. want uh, right, to right, a, a broad right, brushstroke right. here, but in, in some ways, racial division was used and leveraged uh, to create uh, affluent communities mm -hmm. and allow other communities to become uh, poor and, and low income and broken. Now you're in the middle of that community, you see it happening, I can see where your passion is coming from and how God placed you in the time in that culture to make a difference. I, that, that's like clear. But there you are in that whole situation and most kids, most teenagers in that culture are drawn to that site that your parents tell you to stay away from. Yes. Did that happen to you? Well, you know, I was very fortunate that, you know, my mother and father, who are Christians, uh, very much taught me in the way of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., mm. to love pe all people, even to love those that would portray themselves or be portrayed as your enemies. And so I, as, a, as a young kid, through the influence of godly parents, uh, but also through uh, the influence of the writings and the messages of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some people that respond to that kind of brokenness mm -hmm. with anger 
It's why you see riots in certain cities, that some people don't know how to respond to, to, to broken systems and a broken world. But what about world. you yourself? Because here you are. Didn't you tell me that you actually ended up in the wrong crowd, but God stopped it? Oh, sure. I mean, there, I mean growing up in, as, as, as white flight occurred, uh -huh. uh, gangs began to develop a, in my community. And as a teenager, I had cousins and friends that joined gangs. And uh, when it's your friends and your cousins, I mean, you're drawn to that yourself. Yeah. And so I ended up at a party uh, one night when I told my parents I was going to a movie. And I actually went to a house party and there were gang members that were in that party as my neighborhood was changing and a gunshot went off oh. and someone was shot not very far from me. It, it actually could have been me mm -hmm. that was shot that night. Um, and so I remember running out of that party and I was running so fast and I kept looking back to make sure nobody was shooting towards me and I ran into a tree <laughs> and almost knocked myself out and ended up staggering home. Now, most people end up back again because it gets drawn, but that wasn't you. Well, what changed you that night? What, what, what was it? Yeah. Wasn't the cousin that said something like... Oh, yes. I, you know, I had a cousin who was a gang leader, and when he saw me, even after that incident uh, with some uh, gang members, I, I, I couldn't believe this because he wasn't a Christian at the time. He was a gang member. He looked at them and said, leave him alone, not him. Mm -hmm. And then he said, God has something else for him. Wow. And I want to stop it right there. God has something else for Ephraim, but God has something else for you. The next part is, what is the answer? How do we go from here? Stay tuned. <music> Shalom, this is Evangelist Dr. Charles Kazumba. You are tuned in to Bob TV. This is a ministry that gives life to the lifeless. I have been watching this program all the way from Canada. When I got hold of this program and I started watching the, you know, the, 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 pro, the segments that uh, Bob uh, does, my life was changed. I could, have, I could have identify myself with a lot of uh, topics that, that are being taught on this TV. And I love this program because it gives you back what you have lost. And what have we lost? We have lost the touch of God. We have lost the presence of the living God. Through this program and through the words that are taught on this program, you will be reconnected back to your source, to your maker, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the lover of your life. And I am so happy and excited to be part of this program. God bless you. In the 1900s, white Americans represented 88% of the total population in the United States. Since then, not only has the American population almost quadrupled, so has the minority makeup of this country. Population growth is the fastest among minorities as a whole. Statistics show white Americans represent about 62% of the national population today. That means that almost 40% of the population is of the minority. Do you see the change in this? We are no longer the majority or the minority. We're starting to be right here. And that is what you're trying to not just show people, Ephraim. It is not just like we're right here in in population, we should be right here in everything. So when I look at situations like Ferguson, what is the answer? What is the solution that this will not happen again? Yeah, I think the church can play a significant role. Uh, the Bible calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, not to be the dividers, but to be the bridge uh, that in Christ Jesus, uh, Galatians talks about uh, there is no Jew or Gentile, slave mm -hmm. or free, male or female. Now, does that mean there is no longer male and female? Well, of course not. But what that means is in Christ Jesus, the walls that divide us, uh, the things that break us apart can be healed, can be mended. And so I believe that the church can play a significant role in being communities 
uh, that where people can come together in prayer, in authentic dialogue, in worship together, but the church can't wait for people of differences to come in to the church buildings. We have to go out into those communities, not when a shooting happens, uh, but we must, even before something negative happens, we must be the chaplains in the police cars. We, we must be the evangelists on the block. We so must what you're be saying to me basically is like we should be the Jesus on the field <laughs> yes. and bring them in and be yes. what Jesus would do to go out to the people like the Samaritan woman, to go out and say, I care about you, you are valuable to me? Is that what you're exactly. telling me? And, and it means we might have to uh, expand how we see worship and how we see discipleship and small group ministry because sometimes we don't know that uh, our worship, uh, uh, the way that we uh, have church is, is done in the boxes of white and black and red and yellow versus one race of God's beloved children made in His image. So is this the reason why you wrote a book to try to help people to understand the differences and how to get along? Tell me about your book. Yes, yeah, so the post-black and post-white church uh, is really the story of a church that I was fortunate to plant uh, back in 2002. Uh -huh. And I pastored that church for eight and a half years and we were intentionally multiracial and multi-ethnic. We were 50% white. 40% black and the rest uh, Asian and Hispanic. And we grew to be a church of about a thousand people. Wow, and, and usually what happens in those churches, groups form. So how do you work it that the, you don't get all these little groups within the church staying in their groups? Yeah, so we used to have uh, a meal uh, and we would ask people to bring a dish that represented their culture, oh, their okay. upbringing. And so we had the enchiladas next to the fried rice, next to the collard greens. And then we would, we would have worship together. We would uh, eat together. And I would say the same way that we're digesting one another's foods, we need to digest each other's stories, wow. our pain, yeah. our, 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 our hopes, our dreams. And we need to embrace those stories as if they're our own. And maybe that's what the Bible is getting at when it says we must bear one another's burdens. Wow. So what is it, if you could give one word of advice right now to the world today, struggling, pretending they're not, what is the word that you want to tell them in how to make a difference? I would say look at somebody who's different than you, where you work, where you live, where you volunteer, and don't just uh, see past their skin color, uh, see God in their skin color, and take time to listen. I would encourage people to build friendships uh, and, and to be listeners and to hear someone's story, someone's struggle, someone's pain, and maybe God is calling you to embrace that and bear it as mm -hmm. if it's your own. Wow, that's good. Now. Ephraim, if somebody would like to get a hold of you, what, what's your website? Where can uh, they go? Yes, please go to worldimpact.org. Uh, worldimpact.org and you'll learn uh, all that we're doing in urban uh, communities around the country and around the world. And they can come to you for questions as well? Oh, sure, yeah, through the website worldimpact.org. You find can you find there. me Great. and you can shoot me an email at, uh, at really at president at worldimpact.org. Perfect. Ephraim, it was an honor to have you on the show. Oh, thank you thank so much. Thank you for helping us to see it differently. Oh, so and honored. And then uh, I'd like to give you my book, Ransomed. Oh, man. Loving Yourself from the Inside Out. And that's what you're talking about, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. How do we do this different? And, uh, you know, thank you for being on the show. How do we do things different? And I think it is both sides, the minority and the majority, that should work together to make a difference. You have to be willing to be open and to say, I can do this instead of ignorant. And folks, my apologies. I want to apologize to you because I was ignorant for a long, long time and no more. And you can do that same. And this is the key. So then we pursue the things which makes peace. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And that's what you just said. We are building each other up. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20 talks about that as well. Because it says it right here. Therefore, if anyone is a cre in Christ, he's a new creature. That was what Ephraim was saying. We don't matter what color skin we are. If we're in Christ, we are a new creature. The old things passed away. Let it go. Move on. 
Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Key here, key. Work together because as long as we are ignorant about those that are hurting, they are not going to get the help and the chains and the sights stay separate. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, and this is what Ephraim was saying, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to each other, which I just added on here, and be reconciled to God. And when you first turn to God, he will show you how to learn to make a difference. And if all of us would start doing this, Ferguson will not happen again. It starts with me, it starts with Ephraim, and it starts with you. You might have said, I have gotten way too hurt in the past, and I want to acknowledge that hurt. Will you forgive us as a white majority? Because you're not a minority anymore. You're part of the majority. Forgive us for what we've done to you. And will you love us even for what we've done to you? Let us work together. Call us if you have questions, 855-515-5550 or go to barbtv.org. God loves you and all lives matter. Have a great day. In 2010, the total number of suicide deaths in the United States was over 38,000. I say, stop, no more. We are going to fight for our children. It was a marriage of the devil. It was a devil's union. And uh, I still didn't see the signs, the warning signs. And I should have known because I went through that. Catch it earlier, how mm -hmm. to help. So Satan now doesn't just have him, mm -hmm. he has you too. What happens when your son calls you and says goodbye, mom? And I pulled him to the pickup, and I have no idea. He was 23 years old. Was yeah, he but he was so skinny, though. He's so skinny. Drug use? Said no. You said no. You're starting to pray. People mm -hmm. pray with you. Dark. If it's darkness, he calls it, and uh, and he's brought so many young people to the kingdom. Mm -hmm.